Hello. Hi. Welcome to the podcast. On this episode, we're talking to an old friend of ours, Chet Turnbull. So Chet's a ghostwriter. He ghostwrites books, blogs, uh, marketing content, copywriter, um, anything that you could possibly need written, Chet could write it. Yeah, you know, this this conversation kind of really, it, I guess it, it really was about transmedia and how every part of your content is a part of a bigger ecosystem. Bigger ecosystem of content and you need people to be able to engage with it in a bunch of different ways in order to make that splash that everybody wants to make. Right, exactly. Not relying on a single form of content to make you a gazillion dollars, but understanding that an audience wants to have options to engage with a story over a long period of time. So whether that's starting with a book or with a podcast or with a blog or with a video, trying to make an area where your audience feels like they're welcome and that they can basically get lost and away from the real world. So this is a great conversation. If you're watching this on YouTube, it's coming right up. Or if you want to listen to it, it's available on all those audio platforms. Um, either way, enjoy the show. Enjoy. All right, great. Well, we can get started. So uh, we're in conversation with Chet Turbo. Chet, we usually get started with you. Give us a little information about who you are and what you do. Yeah, so I am a hired quill. I'm a ghostwriter, and what that means is that I help people to tell their stories in a way that is meaningful and that they can share with the world. So a lot of times in this day and age with technology being what it is and social media being what it is, we all have a little bit of hesitancy behind hitting publish or pushing send. And so what I do is I help to you know, translate for people who have the gift of gab, like uh, Jack and Frank over here, uh -huh. uh, how to make their voice really shine and you know dress it up to impress on the written page. So I do full length ghost written books where I actually put your book, your voice, your story, all of it, and tailor it to your target audience and help you from, you know, conception of the idea all the way to uh, hitting publish. So and that process takes, you know, anywhere from six to um, 12 months. And I do that. I also do adaptations of um, books and memoirs to screenplays. And so we have some, you know, cross connection there, um, guys. And uh, yeah, I also do a lot of blog writing and copy work. So yeah, really yeah. excited to be on the show today and appreciate you having me on. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the whole ghostwriting aspect of things, um, you know, I... It feels like it feels like more people should be going out and trying to find ghostwriters. Or maybe more people do. We just don't know because you know no matter how much you know, folks, we try to get uh, Chet to tell us who his clients are. He's not going to tell us because no, um, he's a ghostwriter. Because <laughs> he's a ghostwriter. Because that would defeat the purpose. Then all of a sudden, he would have been the one that wrote the book, um, which he did. But um, yeah, so so in, in terms of ghostwriting, especially with all these people with fantastic really fascinating stories um you know the the type of stories that you're like oh well um you know for example i mean i was just talking to somebody the other day um about uh about this gentleman who's you know who's, uh he's like out in north dakota or something like that but the work that he's doing is just absolutely fantastic especially because he's in like so much pain um it's like some sort of uh, physical disability um that happened to him but it's like you find these people out there that that like maybe they get found by people like us or maybe they get found by their friends that are just like, you have such a story. You need to tell people. But those people have no ability. The people that found them or the people that have the story to actually put that in in any form that could then be digested by anybody, um, you know, which is really where you kind of come in and help fix that fix that issue. Yeah, I mean, I find people that, you know, I, I believe in my clients and most people that have a really great story, uh, it kind of is, uh, you know, the cautionary tale that they're afraid to share it with people because it's so good. And they're thinking, oh, my God, what are people going to say? Or like, you know, how do I frame this in a way that's palpable for other people to, you know, to actually resonate with? And so one of the things that we do in ghostwriting is the first thing we do is we sit down and we work on the audience and we figure out who is this for? How are we going to inspire people? And um, I think that the people that find me, you know, are people that really care a lot about the story that they're telling. And in many cases, they've spent over 10 years, you know, uh, typing away and kind of pecking away on the keyboard at, at, at a draft of something. And like you said, you know, it's not legible. There's a lot of different things that are going on. And all that is, is really just um, not understanding the creative process in 
in so much as it relates to the writing process. And so for a lot of people, they're not trained that way like I am. So right. um, so luckily I have that that gifting. And uh, that's one of the only things I think um, it was Hunter S. Thompson that said that, you know, he can write and that's about all he can do. <laughs> so <laughs> if it weren't for that, you know, it's a, it's a hard way to make a living. But thank God it's that. Otherwise, uh, you know, he'd be in the bread line. So. Sure. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Definitely. Because a lot of people talk about, um, and now I'm thinking about another person that has another story about her father and, and all the stuff that he did in World War II and all this other stuff and how much passion, right? Like, they're like, this is such a great story. And there's a hesitation on both sides of being like, what are people going to say about this? But the other one that nobody really talks about is, is anybody going to say anything? Is there even an audience for it, right? So I love that. I, I, let's wrap on the audience aspect of it because I feel like, um, and this could be totally false because I don't really, we, the only ghostwriter that I really know is you, except for maybe maybe Kelsey Hoff that does ghostwriting, but for blogs, for companies oh. and stuff and brand messaging and whatever. But um, from from that aspect, it's like, Okay, yeah, there's this great story. So what we what we should probably do is make up one story that we can keep on referencing back and forth so that we don't have to actually use a real story back and forth, right? But say, say you know, like you just go with the woman and her father in World War II, right? It's a great story, did fantastic stuff over at, uh, overseas, was promoted to this, and then came back and had all this cool, um, you know, entrepreneurial stuff, and he helped the community and all this other stuff. You have this great story, and you know it's so important to you. Um, but the question then becomes, is there even an audience that would want to hear it? You assume that everybody would want to hear this story, but we, you, in, in the industry that we're in, you can't assume that kind of stuff. We have to actually go out and find who that audience really is. Where do they live? Um, you know, and, and if that's, um, and, and, and another way to put it too, is like, is that the book, the right way a ghost written book, the right way to go about that, or maybe in a different form of writing would better attack or a better, uh, be better digested by the audience. Right. Well, I think, and you know, we're, we're very much in alignment with that because we want to see our, our clients position for success, right? At the end mm -hmm. of the day, it's not just about making money. It's about actually making meaning. And so when you want to make something of any consequence in, in our world, and I consider a book, you know, a form of art and um, just like the work that you guys do with filmmaking and, and all of that, um, and really even branding itself is an art form in today's yeah. world. So, but when you go to approach how you're going to tell this story, that's where what I do is called creative nonfiction. And so people say, well, okay, now Chad, this is nonfiction. It's a true story. Where's the creative component come in? Because it's, mm -hmm. it's the truth. So they assume that, you know, there's only one way to tell the story uh, because it's a true story. And that's actually not true. There are a million different creative ways that, you know, if I ask you what you had for breakfast this morning, there's a thousand ways you could set up how that came about, how you had the idea, how you went down the stairs and made it. And so you can frame these stories in a way that's palatable for the audience so that they really enjoy it. They resonate with it. They engage. And we've talked about that before. And, and you know, how you really make sure that the content that you're promoting is something that people actually want, because if there's right. not a market for it, you're going to have this amazing story that, um, that works for people, but it doesn't, it doesn't really hit in the market like it's supposed to. And so, you know, they often say in the publishing world, and this is more the traditional pub houses, that publishing is about 18 months behind whatever's current on the internet. And there's a reason for that because books take a lot of time to write. They take a lot of time to think through. And when you're trying to plan, you know, a year or so in advance, you don't know what those trends are going to be. And it takes time to write the book. So, you know, unless it's a celebrity memoir type thing from, you know, Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama or somebody like that, you can't just pump it out in three, three months. You know, you have right. to where they have a team of writers that are working on it. So um, one joke that um, a friend of mine in Chicago in the ad space, um, ad industry says, is we like to joke, is it a book? Is it a podcast? Is it a blog? Is it just a tweet? Yeah, right, <laughs> you know, right, what, right. what is your content today? Maybe it's an ebook. I don't know. But, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that approach me and, and I'll be very frank with them. Um, frank and Jack uh, is I'll just say, hey, your, your book idea is great, but it's not enough for a full book. You know, I just really don't see this being that. And then, you know, you just kind of how to manage expectations so that it's a, a successful project. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's so important to 
And I can see how difficult it is with book, but what we can do, you know, and we talk about transmedia, right, kind of bridges that gap a little bit, um, especially for something that you're writing a book for, um, because like you said, is is it a tweet? Is it a is it a podcast? What is it? You know, like and a lot of times it could be all four of those things that can help build out this story world. Or as we said in the last podcast that we had for those business folks out there, building an ecosystem of content that all kind of feeds off of each other that can grow and morph depending on what current trends are going on and what type of you know what what's what the conversation is surrounding the subject that maybe the book as you said uh, creative uh nonfiction, um really has to kind of morph itself too so and it also really depends on who's out there to read the book in the first place you know and if that what segment of that audience is actually going to then go like oh well I know that uh, they have a podcast and they have a, a series, but I'm not really into that stuff. What I really want to do is I really want to get down and read the book or to supplement the series. I would much rather have the book rather than the podcast because the book I could pick up and read whenever. And I have this hard copy in at, uh, on the side of the podcast. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's a whole bunch of different aspects there, especially um, from the audience side, um, you know, where, yeah, from the audience side of trying to find out who that audience is um, and what are they looking for in the first place. Yeah, well, and I think um, one of the biggest things in the book industry, just to use that example, is that you know we're moving towards self-publishing. We're, we're you know print on demand, that type of framework. The traditionally published book, the advances are shrinking. It's harder to come by. And what those um, what those deals look like today, they really require the author to have a following on social media. So one of the things yeah. that I encourage people to do is I also, um, you know, uh, I also do a lot of like ghost blogging for marketing companies and for brands and things like that, where it's very audience centric. And what, you know, what I encourage people to do is to write your blog content for a year or two, see what resonates, see what's hitting in the market, and yeah. then take that content. You've already got so many thousand words, put that into to the book and kind of repackage and repurpose. And I think one thing that we're really seeing as, as you know, marketers and as people that just are creatives trying to, to make content in the world is that the way that people engage with content is changing. And it's changing to this, the standpoint that it is, um, you know, I, I remember when I was growing up in high school, you know, we had Facebook and uh, we would talk about, you know, things going on in class and talk about the teachers or whatever, and just kind of, um, you know, what was going on in our lives. And we never thought about, you know, by the time I, I graduated from college, it was like employers were looking at that and people were, it was becoming yeah. ingrained in your professional life. And so, you know, now looking at where Twitter's at and, and kind of how that goes and now Clubhouse, um, right. my point is that the way that we're consuming media has changed and everybody has their preference. I know people who they say, I've met people at, you know, different events and they say, you know, I've, I've never read. I've, I've barely read anything in my entire life. And I say, Oh, well, really? And, and they say, yeah. And I say, well, and then they'll start, they'll make an anecdote about a, a book. And I'll say, well, wait, you don't read. And they say, Oh no, I listen to audio books. Uh, you know, yeah, I have an right, audible right. subscription maxed out every month. I, you know, I work construction or I work outside or whatever. And I just listen right. to those all day or in the car. So I think having those different types of mediums is really important. And that's something that I don't, I, you know, we're just really kind of coming, um, coming into and seeing for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like uh, the where you're coming from with the, you know, people are, are digesting content in a much different way. And when I use the word content, I'm talking about like anything underneath the sun, like live events is content. That's something that you're putting out there for people to interact with. Um, you know, podcasts is content, uh, uh, photos on Instagram are content. Um, and to your point, you know, we could talk a little bit about the collective journey because I know that you were up until 3 a.m. reading that, <laughs> Jeff Gomez, but the with the poorest storytelling, right? And that comes straight from social media. That was poor storytelling came to the forefront because of us, our generation. This is where it was coming from. It came from Facebook. It came from, um, you know, Instagram. And it came from Snapchat, all the Twitter, all the social media where all of a sudden now we had that voice. So yeah, employers could look at us, but we could also talk about the employers <laughs> and we could also talk to the, talk about the marketing and talk about the stories and everything. And when you mentioned the whole blogging, right, it's kind of like, 
And and I really wish we could talk a little bit more about you know the whole Mick Rock and what we're doing with him and everything and more in depth. But I I don't know. I just don't really want to go too far into that. We've teased it on the podcast every so often about this this designer that nobody's ever heard of, but he was the most uh, most prolific. Is that yeah, the prolific. yeah prolific uh, designer never, of the twentieth century. Um, but like. You know, like nobody knows about him, right? And a lot of people that probably approach you to be, you know, to for you to write their book, it, nobody really knows about them, right? This isn't their first. This is like their first attempt to get the story out, right? And and to do something. And to your point with like the whole publish, like they're not gonna publish your book unless you have some sort of an audience, right? Which is what we keep on getting trying people to understand, especially in like the film industry or any creative um, creative art, that if you don't have the following, you're not going to get distribution. Um, they're looking at that stuff. And you have to hopefully at some point be able to quantify and then qualify that audience's attention. And if you're able to do that, then you're going to be really able to then um, – be able to then sell it. It's like, Hey, listen, these guys aren't only just paying attention every so often. They're here all the time. They can't get enough of this. Um, but yeah, so I kind of went on a couple different tangents there and I lost my train of thought. Um, but, but the idea there, we could go back to poor storytelling. Cause the first thing I remembered, right. Was that the audience is talking back to you. So when you do these blogs and you do these little tiny, like breadcrumbs to this larger piece, you're going to be able to test a lot of that stuff and see where the audience is at and how they're interacting with certain things that in the past you probably weren't going to be able to do. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, the blogging is great because like you said, you can not only can the employer look at you, but you can look at them. And and, and, and even more um, important is the fact that you can adjust their story and so you can, and you can be immersive in that storytelling and you can be part of that world you know i like what you said earlier you called it an ecosystem and i really like that you need a content ecosystem because it, re it really is there's so much cross-channel connectivity and kind yeah. of um you know pollination as it were that you really have to feed all these things and one thing that i'll, I'll just say and i'll be very forthright in saying this is that i come from you know there's kind of the marketing world and there's the you know that whole side of things and then there's the story world and so you can probably tell that i'm in this story world you know i've got the the quill and the uh the typewriter at 70 years old in the back of my grandfather's mm -hmm. um and so what i like to say is that when you write your book even if it's ghostwritten because people make this mistake where they think that it's not their book if they and these are clients beforehand prospects um but anybody who's worked with me knows that it's really uniquely their book that i'm not going to come up with that you know source matter subject material I, on my own, you know, it just doesn't just auto populate. I don't just, uh, you know, pull it off of Google and figure it out. I have to know your story. And so I help you to translate it in your words, in the way that you would write it. And so what happens as a result of, of putting out a ghostwritten book, even if you have 10 followers and no one reads it, you have now done this thing that for so many of my clients, it's been a lifelong endeavor. It's been on the bucket list year after year after year. I got to get to my book. I got to get to my book. And so, you know, I had one client who, um, without getting into too much detail, his mother told him that, you know, he just needed to make sure he got a C minus in, in class when he was like, you know, nine years old or something. And mm -hmm. so a C minus, you know, he brought home a D and she was mad that it wasn't a C minus as opposed to something better. So his um, educational and just the way that he thought about like reading and writing, very driven in other pursuits. He was an air traffic controller. I mean, he was like very, very sharp. But he just didn't like have very high expectations for himself to, to write. And so what I'm finding, Frank, is um, that when people put the work in to do a book and to do like a ghostwritten project like this, they have confidence that comes with that. They have clarity on their message. They now, since they have this other, you know, I like to say that I, uh, I bounce ideas off of uh, my clients. You know, I got a mm -hmm. ping pong paddle here and that's what it is. It's, it's a collaboration or a co-creation. So just getting that book in some sort of presentable format does wonders for them when they go to, to get on stage or they want to go make that podcast. Now they have some clarity on what the market market once. And, and a lot of right. times, you know, if you're going to self-publish, it's not the first book, it's the second book that really hits, or sure. it's the fact that now you think of yourself in a different way. Um, so I definitely want to put that out there. It's, you know, I like the idea of art for art's sake is kind of a way it's thrown around in philosophical cir circles. And, um, but um, 
you know, I think the blog content, like back to your, your point is that you can test a variety of different things and you can even test multiple voices. And so I think, you know, you, you think of like a dollar shave club or somebody that's doing ad spots and how they engage with their brand. And and you watch brand narrative shift and change over time. And that's all dictated by what social media feedback in real time. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the definitely going back to the ecosystem, right? It's not even just the, you, you build out this ecosystem that people can then bounce around in too, right? So like if they can't possibly get enough of the book, it's like, well, where do I go now? What else can I, how else can I interact with this story? You know, it's like, is there a second book? Are you going to tease the second book? Or do you have a blog or do you have the podcast? And as you know, especially with the, the McRock stuff, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make it so that there and never, po- never at a point in time is there not going to be something for you to explore further throughout that day, you know, and you could see this in action. Um, and this is all attention, folks, right? Because if you have somebody's attention, if, if um, Chet here, he writes a book and gets a whole bunch of attention and, you know, he's get they get like all this following and all the, like, oh, my God, this is such an amazing story. Um, and then they just stop. Right. Then the attention stops, right? There's way too much vying for our attention nowadays to assume that just because you had the attention initially that you're going to be able to hang on to it for a long period of time unless you're constantly doing new stuff and you're building this ecosystem to then bounce back and forth with, right? And you can see this in, um, uh, I, like, I like bringing up the YouTube um, YouTube ecosystem with those channels that post every day, right? If they miss a day, you go like, oh my God, I hope they're okay. Jeez, all right. like, well, what happened to them, right? Um, but if they don't post for a long period of time, that routine of watch them every day gets changed. I'll find somebody else to fill that void, right? I'll go to this new YouTube channel that I just found to fill that void. So it's the consistency of having new content inside of that ecosystem that really does help flesh out that story, really does help get that um, get those audience members never want or always wanting more, but always being at least something there for them to chew on. Yeah. Well, and I think that's so important. I mean, it's a prescient point in just this, this day and age, so to speak, is that we are 24, seven, 365 hardwired for content. We need something, you know? And um, if I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of brands make is they'll write out, I mean, how many, how many websites do you guys go to where you're, you're doing some background research to buy a product and you look at their blog and their last blog was in 2017. I just had one of those today. So I'll use that as an example. And you think, think, well, are they in business? I mean, are they doing, you know, and then you see another, a random post from 2020 and it's like three years and that's it. And it's like, oh, well, are they, you know, what's going on? There's a disconnect. And, and I think, you know, there's something to be said about a performing artist um, a recording artist to go into the studio, make an album, make two or three in like a five year span and then take four years and build up some hype and tour and do things. But like what people don't understand is that that model is even changing. Spotify is rewarding people for two minute songs. Now they're, they're rewarding. They're like TikTok where you have to loop your video and see how many times it's watched to, to really trigger that out al- of that algorithm. So, mm-hmm. um, I think the way that brands tell their story has to be dictated on how you get that ROI on your attention, how you really captivate people and give it to them in the form and format that they want. So it's like yeah. all these different things. And then on, on top of all that, you know, it's gotta be good content. It's gotta right. be, you know, I get, I get people that call me and they want to, they're very sincere and they want to work on their SEO or they want to do a blog because they hear about this big, you know, this big thing called SEO. And they say, well, what can I do? And I say, well, the first thing is, you know, you need long form content, stop writing your 300 word blog or 500 word blog that nobody cares about. Stop talking about, you know, X, Y, Z employee. Um, you know, that's great for you internal communications to, to do that. But externally, you know, let's bump those up to 1200, 1500 words so that Google likes them. Let's actually, you know, instead of focusing on keyword strategy, which is important, let's actually build something that, I mean, and this is, this sounds like news sometimes, I think to people that people like to read Yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. Know, that people are actually waiting for. And so that's the other thing too. I think when you talk about those, um, you know, those people that produce content every single day and hats off to them. You know, we do it for a living. It's, it's tough, (laughs) but, um, but I'm not posting every single day. I'm just writing every day for, you know, my own purposes or for clients. But I think what happens is that people, even if it's a 23 hour window where they're not being satiated, they're waiting. 
you know, they're on the edge of their seat because they've been trained, you know, they're just, they're conditioned to look for that. And it's, an, it, you know, what's really cool is that we're a mesh in a world that where content is kind of, it's not like a therapy per se, but it's, it's an outlet. It's a creative expression where you can share in someone else's story and be a player and feel like yeah. you're really participating in that story world. You know, just like this podcast, people like it, they know it, they trust it. That's a right. three-step um, success system for sales. So, you know, they're going to come back. And right. so I think in that buying journey, they have to be rewarded for wanting to come back because God forbid, you know, somebody wants to buy your product or read your blog and you don't write it, you know? And yeah. so that's what I tell my clients. I'm like, don't die with your story stuck inside you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jack, I want to talk about the the website how you know after 17 you know we see that all the time in video oh yeah, yeah. right 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 well it's like well it's the same thing with video it's like you know <clears throat> it, it, i'm but i mean you know this kind of just like it, it's it's stupid when people are like well i mean this was also when we were trying to sell video right which isn't and, something that we're doing right now which isn't really what we're in right now but it's like you know you, you ask for a higher quality product and then you expect to pay the same price and then you somehow justify the other price saying, well, you know, they only had, they only charged us half what you're charging us. And I mean, we've had that video for like five years and it's like, <laughs> all right, awesome. I go to your website and I see that video that was posted five years ago and I'm like, are they okay? Just yeah, like right. 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 With your exactly what you're saying. Are they in in business any? it doesn't seem like it you know right they'd be doing other videos if they're still in business right yeah and, and then let's go back to that that whole idea of this of the story world of you know having i love what you said about like don't the last thing you can do right is earn some or the la yeah, last thing you should do is you can earn somebody's attention with something and then just stop and they expect it to be there and then it disappears you break that trust we talk about earning attention is very similar to earning trust, right? It's the same steps. You're always earning, you know, you're earning trust by if we're going to earn trust here in, in chat, we, we've been building on this trust for, you know, a year plus now. 2019, two years, yeah. probably two years in, in June or May or something like that. It was warm it was, outside. It was, it was Anyways, but, you know, that trust is goes back and forth, right? And that's why I love having these conversations because you end up building trust with a podcast guest and that's really like one of the main reasons why we do it. Yeah. You're building that trust, right? You, you, you talk about certain things or synergy, um, you know, you you're, you're offer up value when you can um, and you have engaging conversations. It's the same thing with an audience's attention that doesn't have a direct line to actually speak to you, but through your content, you're earning their trust. They're like, oh yeah, oh you know what? I didn't know what I was going to do on Monday, but yeah, the In Conversation podcast comes out on Monday at 11. Oh, that's right. I can do that. That fills up my Monday afternoon into lunch, I guess. I don't know. Um, you know, or on my way home, I, I get to I get to listen to these two idiots and they talk about stuff that, you know, doesn't make any sense or whatever, however you're listening, right? Um, and we think highly of you, audience. Yeah, right. We think very <laughs> highly of you. Um, right? But then if we were just to stop, without any warning and just go cold turkey for two years and then come back again, any attention that we had would be totally gone. It'd be totally gone. Um, and everybody like, huh, what? And then they look and they're like, oh yeah, there was a two year gap there. I wonder what happened. That's kind of weird. Is it worth my time to invest back into this podcast if I know they're going to be so spotty with it? Right? Is it worth my time? to in my investing my time because once again our attention spans they're not short they're limited no. we only have so much attention to give there's only 24 hours of the day and we do need to sleep so like what's gonna earn our attention what earns my attention you know like i i got a guy that posts every day at two o'clock right he's got my attention it's two o'clock that's usually when i have like i don't know an afternoon snack usually when i eat lunch actually but like oh right call me kevin he, he comes out at two o'clock every day brilliant right he's earned my attention if he disappears for a month i'm gonna be like he better be dead or something <laughs> terrible must have happened because if he's expecting you know without any explanation coming back um and getting back into my routine you know there's there you lost the trust and then thus you have lost the attention 
Yeah, well, and uh, Frank, there's actually a term for that. Now, this is ironic, and I can't advocate for it as a ghostwriter, but it's called ghosting. <laughs> you know, so if you if you just if you're showing up and then you just disappear, it's called ghosting. And so, right. and and I think a lot of people understand, you know, how how that affects a relationship. But what people need to to really um, I guess absorb and really meditate on is that the only reason to go into making content to begin with is to establish a relationship with the end consumer with the end yeah. listener with the end viewer it's not a should because if it if you go in feeling like i should do this and i know i should and i da da da, da and you're kind of on the fence it's not authentic it's not genuine it's something that you want to do you know like coming on this podcast you invited me i saw it i immediately said yes and then you know here we are we made it right. happen because i wanted to do it you wanted to have me on and that's right. you know and so that's what i think these conversations and all of this stuff around social media and, and blogging and, and any kind of content is that you're building that relationship that pays dividends down the road. And the other thing too, right. is that I just, I, I wish people would understand that you can plan out content ahead of time. You know, you can repurpose and repackage content. If you, you know, start taking a daily journal, you can do it on your phone and voice dictate just a few sentences to give you like a, a little extra oomph in your creativity, you know, mm -hmm. so that when you go to write that blog, you already have ideas. I keep a running list of blog ideas every day. And mm -hmm. so, because I just want to get in the habit, it's uh, one of James Altucher's, um, things where he uh, wrote about and choose yourself is where you come up with 10 good ideas every day. And so what happens is when you start to commit to that creative process, it actually, it, um, they, they replicate. And I think he called it creative brain children. They multiply or whatever, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, so having that kind of a sense about this content, I mean, what would you guys say are the trends with pandemic going on now? I want to turn it back. Cause I know that you guys were doing a lot of video heavy stuff back when we met, uh, you know, almost two years ago. Right. And now it's, it's obviously shifted because of, uh, because of the climate. So, you know, how can, um, how can people relate to their audience and build that relationship now that everything's kind of changing? Yeah, right. I mean, so our shift, though it did happen during COVID, was not strictly because of COVID. This is, we've been, well, Chet, uh, if I was to give you like the background of, event, of our really journey don't. here, I mean, yeah. it's a, a snaky road that started in video production because that's what we did. We were filmmakers. We were trying to create videos that people actually would want to watch. And then as we went down that road, you know, in we 2017, that, we realized that the only brands that wanted to pay for videos, they wanted videos that no one wanted to watch, like interview videos and stuff. And I was like, I would rather just shoot myself in the foot. I mean, yeah. like, seriously, um, you know, because nobody's going to watch that. And then it comes back on, you know, the clients all thrilled with it. But then they're like, why didn't anybody watch it? It was like, well, it's because it was an interview video with people that nobody knows, <laughs> you know, like, what do you expect to happen? But then we found, you know, like we, we used to try to use these statistics for video of like, oh, there are, you know, more eyeballs and people watch it, blah, 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 blah. But none of that stuff even makes any sense anymore. Um, you know, the attention well, of a goldfish, um, that's what we have now. I'm like, that's not even remotely true. I mean, you, you have to earn the attention, yes, but we have a limited amount of attention. If you yeah. think you have a short attention span, then why are you making any content at all? Yeah, um, people are selective. You have to be selective with the amount of attention. You know, 20 years ago, there was like, I mean, not 20 years ago now. Well, that's 2000. 40 years ago. Wow. <laughs> 40 years ago, you know, it, there was three television channels. You right. know, it's yeah. like uh, vying for attention. No. <laughs> I think, yeah, everyone was able to get attention there, you know. Right. So only right. three places to go. Right. Uh, but now there's over there's over a thousand streaming sites. Right. And right. that's not even it, talking about television, you know. Right. And, and so then, yeah, like, well, like identifying that whole trend and everything. And once again, when we got to meet Jeff Gomez, which um, you read his blogs, and we highly recommend everybody read his blogs because it's just absolutely phenomenal of how storytelling is changing. And us being more native storytellers than we were video production people, period, right? Yeah, right? right. Um, led us down this path of the trans of transmedia, the collective journey. And luckily, once again, we met... Um, you know, Tim Anderson, um, well, I don't know if he wants his name on the podcast. He's, um, they're probably not going to find the right one. The, you know, and his brother with, with the, the designer and everything is really allowing us to really test some of that stuff um, of being a transmedia producer and allowing Jack to write the, you know, 
the uh, it's not a, a, a more of like a bio or based on a true story biopic series streaming a bio series, series a bio okay. series based <laughs> off of his be. life and everything and uh, that's how that's how we ended up going down the path and ended up where we're at right now um, yeah so oh there was another thing what what else did you say right before right before you got us down that weird road of of explaining what what how we ended up where we are now uh, it was a good point. And I totally forgot well, what it was. It's not about memory of a goldfish. Yeah, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Damn, we're proving ourselves yeah. wrong. Right. I cannot remember for the life of me what it was. But, you know, we could talk a little bit more about adapting um, because I think that's an interesting conversation. And a lot of things like one of the things that I really like don't like, you know, as a screenwriter is that everyone says, oh, the book was better. And, you know. It there's a difference. Ding 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 ding. Here we go on the bop between no. Chet and Jack. It's about to get ready. No, but to go. but there is a difference because <laughs> he's got the paddle. He's got the paddle. I, I I don't have anything. I'm gonna go fist the cups. No, but it's like they're different. They're different mediums. They do different things. And one of the things you realize when you're trying to adapt a book into a screenplay, you realize certain things in a screen, certain things in a book do not work in a screenplay. And one of the things that I think, one of the things that's most jarring is that there's, in a, in a screenplay, everything, like, if you have two scenes that go back to back, they are juxtaposed because the images are right back to back. So there has to be a reason you jump from that to that. In a book, a chapter ends, the new chapter can begin from a different perspective, and it doesn't have, doesn't really have to be juxtaposed in that same way because our brain isn't isn't making that connection because of the visual cue. So one of the best parts, one of the best um, examples of this in a screenplay was in the Game of Thrones pilot. We hadn't heard of, we, we never, we weren't introduced to Daenerys yet. And we have already were introduced to this whole world where there's a hundred different people. There's ice zombies already. And they're in the crypt. Uh, I think it's Robert and uh, Ned, are, Ned Stark are in the crypt. And they're talking about, you know, Ned's dead um, sister who was obviously killed by someone. And he said to, and, and Ned said, well, you know what? They're dead. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't kill anyone else. They're all gone. And then Ned, and then um, Robert Baratheon says, not all of them. And then we cut straight to Daenerys. We don't know who Daenerys is. We don't know who that girl is. The blonde a blonde girl who's, I think she was naked when we first saw her. We don't know who she is, but we know exactly who she is. We never were introduced to her name. No one said this is who she is, but we know who she was because of how it was juxtaposed. And that's something that, I mean, that's not how it was written in the book. Right. Yeah. Well, actually, I'll, I'll echo. I'm sorry, I don't know if there's some uh, no. delay or there, but um, I'll echo that uh, sentiment, Jack, because uh, one of the things that I'm, images that immediately conjured in my mind and I, I i love that screenwriting analogy it's so true you know you're you know you're jump cutting from here to there and in a book you can jump cut all day you know you can do all this stuff all over the place and no one cares because it's all in their mind but the thing that came to my mind is that when you're a um you know a coach or you're an expert or you're insert you know whatever it is that you do because today's world we're all a business of one basically mm -hmm. you know we're all like in our own personal profiles that's how we sell ourselves, whether you're a, you know, a nine to five employee or you're an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur. But what, what happens is when you have a book, we don't know who, you know, this person is, but when we see the title of their book, we immediately know who they are. So we've never even heard them speak. We haven't seen their website. We haven't seen anything about them. We just see a name and a title. And now immediately they're that person. And the, I, I got to say this too, is that the book, no one, if someone doesn't read your book, they still associate you as the person that wrote the book on that subject. So I think, you know, there's, there's this also this element of just putting out content and just the fact that, you know, you're saying you write screenplays like that. Now people know that you write screenplays. And I think that that's one thing that, that people, when you, when you talk about adapting, that's some of the, the real kind of Jedi mind hack of that is just talking about what you do and engaging with like-minded people. And, um, and so content definitely is going to change. So, you know, I'll kind of pin it back to you guys, you know, 
with this transmedia, with all this evolving media. And you've got, and that's why I asked that question earlier, Frank, about, um, you know, how you guys have pivoted, because I know your story is kind of like this, like a lot of people's. And, uh, yeah. and, I, and I think that better serves your clients, you know, because mm -hmm. I started off as a, uh, a freelance writer and wanting to do like just online courses. And then I wanted to write for myself. And then I found ghostwriting, which was like, you know, meet uh, intersection right. in the middle. So, so what do you think, you know, in that, that world of adaptation, what's, uh, what's happening? Um, yeah, in, yeah. Adaptation, I guess in, in, in what way, I mean, cause what, what ends up, what ends up happening? I mean, I love what you said about the, you know, the automatic association between the author of something and then the content, regardless if they read it, it becomes, you know, like if, regardless if any, if, uh, if that one person reads it, somebody did, and somebody then thinks of you as a thought leader in that industry profession or whatever it is. Right. Um, and so the, the point there would be that it's like, yeah, if you want to be considered a thought leader or anything, right, you have to then produce content with your name on it. Right. Like you have to go, like you could be the smartest person in the world. I mean, in a certain thing. And, and if you don't tell any, if you don't talk to anybody, nobody is going to associate that with you. Yeah. Right. Um, you have to produce that content. You have to actually go out there and, and, and start to show face. And the, uh, well, a, a quote that's coming to my mind is from, of course, Snoop Dogg. And one of it, one song way back when, um, is that it ain't nothing to it, but to do it, you know? Um, and it sounds like a lot of people that you talk to on a regular basis, right. These prospects are like, Oh, well, it's like, oh, well, what? I don't even know. Like, oh, I just have to. It's like, yeah, start writing down those ideas every single day, um, you know, for a blog and then start to come up with some of these um, ideas. Um, oh, actually, you know what? I, I remember what I was going to say earlier. It's, it's like trickling there. Right. So a great thing, too, about you writing those little ideas down, if you take it from a business standpoint, what ends up happening is, is that you could start to do little blogs and snippets about things that you're hearing in your industry and things that you're helping people actively with, right? It's a very organic way to come up with new things to say, whether that's via video or a blog or however, or a podcast or whatever, right? Like I was talking to this chiropractor who would identify himself as a chiropractor, but I always forget what he is. It's like a neuroscientist with the upper neck or something like that. Um, and he is like, Frank, man, I, I just want to do some videos, you know, but I just don't know what to do. And I'm like, I need your help. And I was like, all right, all right, all right. Well, it's like, you know, we just kind of did a, a spitball back and forth. I'm like, why don't you do like a weekly thing where you, you talk about something that you kept on hearing in the office that week, right? Some problem that it seemed like everybody had this problem or one question that really stuck out in your mind and do a, a quick 10 minute video about, or five minute video about you, and how to solve that issue, exercises that they could do to prevent that from happening, or what to do if you ended up with this type of stiff neck or anything else like that. Um, and so, yeah, I, it just just a heart back on the idea. Of, like if you if you're writing down your ideas constantly, right, you will always have something come back. Because I feel like, especially in the content game, and why people tend to stop is because they feel like they have nothing else to say. There's nothing else to talk about. There's nothing nobody else to talk to, right? We run into that every so often on the podcast. We're like, we have explored every aspect of filmmaking, branding, and marketing. There is nothing else out there. We know all the thought leaders. Who else could possibly be? And then you run into like 10 people mm -hmm. that you're like, wow, holy cow. Like my whole life just like shifted. And all of a sudden this just got a lot more complex or just gets got a lot more simple. Um, so you got to be constantly writing that stuff down because then in turn, right, if they have the, that, that, information to give it to you to then make a book makes that a uh, hell of a lot easier and a lot a lot quicker of a turnaround right well and i mean so i was a uh, case in point today i was speaking with a business coach and she was explaining to me how you know there's 29 people always say that the the coaching space and the consultant space is oversaturated with the, with all the online platforms are today and sure. um and, and her response to that is there's 29 million small businesses in america and 3 million business coaches. So that's a pretty good ratio. There's more than enough pie to go around. You know, there's sure. a lot of, so, and I think that's, that's the case with everybody. And, and the one thing that I would say is that if you're really struggling with what to say in your marketing or in your messaging, 
for the first thing that comes to mind is ask your audience what they want to know about, you know, yeah. I mean, ask them who they want to hear from, ask them, you know, what they want. And then the second thing is I'll say that everybody's unique in the sense that um, these six inches between your ears are different. There's a different mm -hmm. perspective. And so when you can share just a little bit about that, we all had different days and we all have different reactions to these, you know, um, for example, we both back in 2019, we both lived in Chicago in two different neighborhoods. When I came to your neighborhood, I won't say which one it was. Um, you know, we uh... <laughs> chat. Nobody's stalking us yet. So that's fine. Yeah, it was Lincoln Square. We're at Cafe Sal Marie. We frequent that place. If you want to. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to do like a whole like a paparazzi thing. You're more than welcome. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we were it's the but... podcast guys who think all the <laughs> listeners are morons. <laughs> it's that all the listeners are morons. <laughs> We did not well, say I, I, yeah, so I, I mean, I made the joke and we sat down that, you know, we were rivals because I was from Logan Square. They're from Lincoln Square. And, uh, right. you know, so um, but it's it's um, it's you know, it's great to um, uh, for, lost my train of thought there in that in that joke. Uh, <laughs> but uh, forgot the punchline. Uh, it must have been a brunch line. But <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I think we were having brunch in the first place. Right. right exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I mean, there's. But it was something about coming up with with content, consistent content, and knowing mm. what your audience was was coming up with or who your audience was. Um, and I can kind of riff off that a little bit as that train of thought comes back to you, because you know there's a, as you said, if there's in the business coaching world, right, or any sort of coaching or any type of consultancy, right, there's all these businesses, and there's a smaller, much smaller amount of people that are trying to get all those businesses. So there's plenty of pie to go around. So to have that stop you from making content doesn't make any sense either, or even trying to go into that business. Um, we were just talking to a podcast uh, coach, uh, Sia Yazo Tornrat, mm -hmm. aha, mm -hmm. um, and um, talk about complex last names, um, but. She was talking about like very much like a library, like the you know you have the uh, you have a library full of books, and yet people are still writing books, right? right? Oh yeah, there's like mm -hmm. in the course of human history, there's been like seventy million books published or something like Probably that with a billion. Yeah, right. Well, something like that in all of human history, and people are still writing books. People are still reading books, and it's like that's the whole argument about like when people are like oh should I do this video blog pod podcast thing everybody's has a podcast now it's like right yeah of course you should you know if you have something you need to say then you should do it right um because at, at the very least even if you're only able to get like 10 or 50 people to listen to it consistently that's 10 50 people that you're actually inspiring right yeah and that yeah. you're actually getting if it's a business orientated thing that you're actually getting into um into your top of your funnel yeah. or if it's a, a more of an entertainment type thing, people that you you would they enjoy your your, your yeah. spending time with you. So and, and it comes to another thing where it's like you know your goal for success doesn't have to be McDonald's. Like it doesn't have to be on every corner. Everyone doesn't have to right. love everything. Not, well, I don't know if anyone who really loves McDonald's food, but not everybody has to eat McDonald's <laughs> food. You know, you know, not, you don't have. I mean, you could be. But very, like there are a lot of one place restaurants that are very successful. Oh, yeah. you know, and so if you're saying that, well, you know what, I'm not going to start this podcast because I know that in five years I'm not going to get that hundred million dollar Spotify deal like Joe <laughs> Rogan. Then right. you know, okay, but that's one way of success. There are plenty of podcasts out there that you know they're not balling, but they're surviving doing it. Right, you know? they're doing enough to to get or have their audience engage with them. That's the most important part. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that, that's one thing too. I think that I, I really like to um, position my clients for success from the first conversation forward is, is just managing those expectations. And, and I think a lot of people have this pipe dream of the million dollar book advance and sure that exists, but it's a unicorn. You know, it's like um, it's like having, uh, you know, Quentin Tarantino call you up and say, I want you to be in the next franchise. I've decided I'm not going to make, you know, whatever it is, 10 movies or whatever he's committed right. to. I'm going to actually make the next 10 and you're going to be the star. I picked you off of that one YouTube video that you made in 2019. Um, right. So but what I but where they do find success is that they now have this credible package thing that's good. And if it's, if people like it and the market's primed and they do the work <clears throat> cough, cough to sell it right. on the other end, cause that's just, you know, packaging and, and all of that is in, 
getting a final product ready is one thing, but then your client, you know, you know, this in the video production world, they're the ones posting it and sharing it and doing that. And so it's really the onus is on them to make it successful, but, but success looks different in different forms for different people. And so when you go to that, that speaking conference and you're only in front of 3000 people, and then you get 30 new deals next month because of that, and your business starts to boom and take off and you hire people, but like none of those people maybe bought the book per se or went to right. hear you speak because of it, but now they are, and now they're sharing it. You know, there's a lot of different ways that success comes from it. And just having these conversations, I think, you know, it, it is where a lot of that um, connection happens and kind of the magic yeah. as it were. Yeah. We have to get off of the, the thought of the one form content that's going to make you, you know, a gajillion dollars, right? It really is the ecosystem yeah. or the story world, however we want to put it, that um, that then sells the idea, right? And we were just talking about this well earlier today, but last week for our podcast listeners, um, with uh, with two guys, uh, Ken Cameron and Russell Stratton, who have a book called "I Need a Effing Talk to You" because that's what they do. They they do um, live. Uh, simulations with actors to help employees and companies go through Training. difficult uh, yeah. conversations, but they have the book and now they have the podcast and now they have the online course and they're planning on doing, you know, in-person stuff and, you know, and or they like have a mastermind webinar, a mastermind, too. right. Mastermind webinar. Thank you. And, um, and then also the actual them coming in and doing the service for you. Right. So there's a million points of entry into that ecosystem. Now, is the book going to sell more than the mastermind class? I don't know. Let's right. find out which, yeah. which one's going to resonate most with the audience. But the fact of the matter is, is that if they do the mastermind class and they want something to hang on with them at all times, then they buy the book. Right. right. And right. so you're building this ecosystem for people to come in whenever, however they want and interact and get lost into an ecosystem. And then uh, and another then, point you know, is that, if you ever need help with forum theater or want to do that for your company and you've already joined the I need to effing talk to you story world, there is a little chance that you're shopping around for somebody else, right? They're committed at that point. It's like, oh, I'm in, I'm, they have my attention. I love what they do. Maybe somebody does what they do. I don't know. Never looked. I like them, you know, and that's that whole from, from the book aspect. Is it going to be the book or is it going to be the podcast or is it going to be some other form of this story? But the point is, is that they have the option to then do the book, right? If they want to learn more or if they want to be more engrossed. And just to go back to the Mick Rock thing with the podcast, it's going to be a great conversation with some of these people that everybody knows. George Benson, Steve Stevens, Shaka Khan, these people that you're like, wow, they're amazing, right? Artists that know this guy. And then when the series comes out, it's like, oh, it's just a a drama, a, a drama, a, a drama, 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 dramatization, dramatization. Thank you, Chad. Dramatization, right? dramatization. Yeah, yeah, dramatization. <laughs> a dramatization <laughs> of those events no that we get to. Right, no hesitation. <laughs> yeah, no, he with no hesitation. <laughs> but no you get hesitation. to you get to actually experience that through film through a series and feel like yeah. you're actually there in the stories that they're talking about. Right. But, you know, it, and it's just like, you know, going to back what you were saying too about artists, you know, about how, you know, maybe if, you know, if you're an artist, you know, you write your one, you write your two books, then you take a month off or two years off, you know, to get more material. But, you know, the other thing about doing multiple different forms of content is that you're not actually thinking about the other form of content, but the other content that you're doing is helping you formulate and inform the next part. So sure. let's say you do that one song or, you know, I don't know what, let's say you write this one book and you have to take a couple of months off or a couple of years off before you write your other one. I mean, how else are you going to engage people? So maybe that's what, you, that's why you do those blogs that are helping to compile your thoughts for that next book but also engaging your audience to say hey these are some of the things that i might be talking about in the next book you know right or you do right. that podcast where you basically just dive deep down into the book and all the themes and you realize that well hey you know this one chapter that was in this book really was a really is a huge uh podcast everyone was talking about this one so i should right. go super deep into this one right. for my next book so right and it's about mm -hmm. and you know so it's like it's not over tapping your creativity you know you're not draining yourself 
you're actually in that discovery play mode with one of those forms of content. It's like the help of Void, Writer's Block. I don't know. Um, for me, sometimes I push paint around and I paint. And, you know, that's just another form of content that I, you know, if I wanted to, someone would buy that painting, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? So, I, but, you know, I don't have any uh, super emotional attachment to that. But then again, then after that painting, then I can go and say, hey, you know what? I know what was wrong with this scene or I'm writing mm -hmm. this version from this particular point now. But it's because I'm doing multiple different contents. You know, you have your multiple spinning plates. You're not focused on one that is wobbling your focus on all the other ones that are spinning. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's so, that's so very true. And I think, um, you know, one thing that I, I'd like to think about it, you're in that kind of creative sandbox, right? So I go for a run if I need some creativity or I'll play my guitar, which is completely, you know, um, David Gilmore, the guitarist for Pink Floyd, he said uh, that some, that uh, music is another language. And um, for him, he felt like it was the way that he could truest speak. And I thought that was just so poetic and beautiful and because it, it is, it, you know, a lot of my clients and, um, and people that we interact with, they're not as good at, at the written form of communication. They're better with the verbal or they're even better with like the visual and some of that or, or branding. And I think um, one thing that I would, I would stress in some of this adapting um, kind of talk is when you build out that storyline, someone like, um, you know, us who are working on these projects in tandem with clients, we're taking a collaborative approach where we're, you know, like I said, bouncing ideas off each other. And so that actually in and of itself is kind of creating a story world because it's creating a relationship between the two of us that then we use those kind of that collaborative approach. It's kind of in our alchemical, like, you know, melting pot, our cauldron, and then it becomes something else. It actually transforms into something that people can actually have, you know, a conversation about. They can, they can interact with it. But when it's just stuck in your head, when it's not, when it's the paint, the idea or the conception for the painting, when it's just on you, you know, no one gets to enjoy that. But once you start to put the, the brush, so what I'm hearing, you know, to kind of summarize some of this, I'm, I'm hearing is that one way to adapt is just to commit to action. And yeah. um, in this kind of world, just to commit to something and then that'll spawn, that'll spur new ideas and, and, and give birth. But I wanted to ask you guys, because I'm really, I'm really intrigued by this idea of building out the story world, and especially as it relates to content, because so many people want to do this cross pollination between all these channels, right. but they don't know how, how, how do you, how do you work on that? How do you guys, you know, really fixate on that and make, make magic happen there? Yeah, I mean, you have to first off, you have to start off with exactly what the what the goal is. So like with a with a story, it's very easy. It's not easy, but it's it's easy to pinpoint exactly what why would somebody want to get lost in this story world? What's causing them to then exit real life and get lost somewhere else? Right. Yeah. So like Harry Potter, um, right. Just using them as an, as an example, that story world is people they want to believe that there's this world that's intertwined with ours that we just can't yeah. see uh, essentially i mean and i was listening to a podcast on story world and i don't know steel philip heck is one of the persons who works with jeff gomez but he he said that all great story worlds have a lie that differentiates them from the real world so what is your lie like frank's talking about harry potter the lie is that witchcraft and wizardry is real and, and interacting with real life. It's not and, like a different on a different planet. Yeah, and, and it, it's true. And so when you go there, you're like, oh, well, there's the possible. Now, when you're in this world, there's a possibility that these things can happen and I can experience them. And so yeah. one of the things, like if you're talking about a story, um, a novel or anything, you, ask, you have to ask yourself, is this something that can live in a larger world? Because not everything can. Sure. Uh, not everything can. A lot of times it's just a one-off story and you know that's that's fine you know um but what is the lie what is your lie what what is the lie of that world why why is it that it can be a ta tapestry of different things that happen around right. so is it like mm. this, you know witchcraft and wizardry you know is or it like in the right in the mick rock uh story world it's because he was around fame but he was never famous himself so to be around fame but you yourself still be everybody famous knows you, but you don't know, but nobody else knows who you are. And, um, and, and, you know, that, that informs all different forms of the content that we're creating, like right. podcasts. One reason why we really want to do podcasts is like, cause then you're going to actually hear these real stories that these people 
have actually, and, and you're like a part of it. You're like, oh wow, because a lot of times if you're in a good podcast, you start you start to nod, and you're like, oh wow, that'd be fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah, right. And you know, and all of a sudden, then you know these stories about these famous people, and you can be listening to that in that great conversation on the train, and no one's what. Hey, I heard you were in that conversation with them. You know, right. You know, well, right, can right. I give like you? Can I give you an autograph? Can, 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 can you can can you give me an autograph? Right. You were talking to that one guy that one time, you know, so it's right. that much. Yeah. So it, it, essentially that, that's, right. that's, that's, that's the core of it. It's like what, what differentiates your world from the real world. Right. And so if you take it from that's from the like entertainment kind of side, and then from the brand side, it's very much of what that mission and value statement. Well, it's more of the value statement is um, for your, what, what is your content really should be focusing on is that, what value you're providing back to society, to the environment, to whatever, right? What's the value? What's your value statement? What's the thing that gets your employees excited about working for you? What gets your customers excited about being working for you? And once you identify what those on either side, right, that is, then you can start to build out content, the idea of content for an immediate attention, short attention, and long attention. An immediate attention it's just like, oh, it's it's a quick little thing. It's uh, most uh, commonly compared to uh, fight or flight, right? Like you see something, you're like, oh, should I pay attention to this? Do I need a, do I need a fight? Should I run away? What should that be? Uh, short attention is when they start to get a little bit of interest and they start to explore a little bit further. And then long attention is when they're diehard fans. Like an easy one to think about long attention for in the business world is Gary Vee. It doesn't matter what that man does. He can go off and start <laughs> to, you know, become a, a marble uh, quarryist. Quarryist? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Anyways, he, he's making quarries for uh, for for Marvel. He's making quarries for Marvel. Yeah, he's just out there and he's just hammering away. Not qu quarrying for marbles. He's making quarries for marbles. Yes, it's a it's a storage thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, but he can do whatever he wants. He has long attention, right? And so when you're thinking about it from those terms, then it's like okay for a, for a story world, right? Just going back to Mick Rock, we have to introduce him to the world, right? So a podcast is a great way to do that. Blog and his current workings that he's doing is a great way to do that. And for a brand, is it going to be more of like, hey, these are the products that we have. This is the kind of impact that we're trying to do. This is how you can purchase them, all this other stuff, and really interacting with the audience and understanding what they're looking for to then eventually what's getting long attention to us in a brand standpoint is doing documentaries and getting distribution from Netflix. That's because a you told yeah. That's could. Well, because that's a know, perfect goal. Yeah, because you know there was this one person who was I was I was like some webinar for you know marketing um, to this G Zen generation, and one of the people was like you know they they had to redo their numbers because you know there's sh some kind of online shoe store they had to redo their numbers because of COVID. They're like, oh, no one's going to be buying shoes anyway. Then the Last Dance came out, and all of a sudden they broke all the, the expectations for their pre COVID numbers during oh. COVID. And they're like, if there was, that was the perfect form of content for shoes, uh, for shoes. He's like, that was the perfect form of content. She was like that we, and if there was any way we could have somehow controlled that, it would have been, it, I, she couldn't even imagine it being better than it was, but she knew like there was this thing. It's like, Oh, if only we could have, somehow got into those conversations and controlled that content. We're able to plan it out when on our side. It's like, that's the can. story world. You, you can, you just have to <laughs> not think of flash sale promotion uh, for your that's commercials. You world. know, you have to, you know, build up to the point where, you know, yeah. So like you can actually do something like that and right. actually have the pull to do it. Like in short, that's essentially what this is. Instead of being reactive, you're proactive. Right. So if you build out this strategy ahead of time, right, like chat, they come to you, they have this book and you're like, you know what? And you're like, dude, this has real potential here. And then we start to start to think about, OK, well, yes, the book priority number one, the blogs, then going into the book, that's priority number one. But where else could we take this? And whether or not that it actually goes down that route, because things will change. We need to listen to the audience and figure out what that you know decision is. But once we know that that's the direction that we're trying to go in, you're proactive. You're actively trying to get your audience more engaged with more and more complex content. Um, rather than in that situation where it was very reactive, 
had they had been planning or had seen the opportunity way back when and known that obviously people are going to buy more basketball shoes and Michael Jordan being the biggest basketball shoe out there, Air Jordans, right? A documentary about, you know, the championship Bulls runs would be a perfect opportunity to sell shoes. But it's it's a little far out there. And that's what, like, I, I was talking yeah. to the podcast that I was on earlier today, they were there. He was saying, it's like, it's hard for people to see that far in the future. I'm like, but how could you not? I mean, how much money did they make? Yeah. Like that's the power of it, you know? Right. It, it, it comes down to really seeing the, it's, it's seeing the potential in having people's attention, you know, it's, right. it's seeing that that ROI is going to pay you dividends in the back end. So and, much. The other great part about, you know, listening to your audience, being in that conversation, and the only way you can participate in a conversation is by producing content as a brand. I mean, you know, that's the way you can, that's the way you engage with your audience. You create content, they tell you what they, like, oh, I don't like that. So you shift it up and you're actually in that conversation. But once you're in that conversation, you can actually be a part of trends as opposed to trying to capitalize on a trend that happens. Capitalize on a trend trying to circumnavigate the like oh well everyone's drinking ocean spray now on a you know on a a long board (laughs) i guess we're gonna have to pay that man 50 million dollars so he can keep doing it you know it's like well if you were actually in the conversations producing content you might have been able to figure out how that would have happened right and then you're right react now you're active instead of reactive right well, I love, I love firstly that you guys are talking about um, this novel concept. I mean, who would have thought of this, that you can actually plan your content out ahead of time and you can kind of see the playing field. I mean, I don't know, but I, I think that just, that's a testimony to, you know, how people need to outsource some of this material. And I was had a conversation earlier today where we were discussing how it saves time, but it also is just a smart idea to have wise counsel on your, your staff. And, and when you're creating a product, I think, did you guys freeze? No, no. Okay. Oh no, we got you, you again, freeze, go ahead. But you All were right. still Some, talking to us. Some, yeah. Sometimes, call me crazy, I might've lost my marbles, but uh, I uh, sometimes I get uh, stage fright on Zoom, so I, I freeze up. So. Oh, okay. Just, uh, oh, gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. Go. <laughs> but um so uh you know i'll be here all week folks no um <laughs> for your for your sake i won't be um for your sanity but no i i guess um one thing i want to jump back to is you guys touched upon and, and kind of building out these story worlds so you know jack you mentioned the um what you called the lie and how yeah. there's always a lie in these story worlds and i think that's so true and i'm going to spin that a little bit so instead of calling it a myth i mean instead of calling it a lie let's call it a myth and then let's let's um, we're going to do a little uh, crossover between the hero's journey and then what Jeff Gomez is doing called the collective journey. So for my clients, they have what's known as imposter syndrome. A lot of times, who am I to write this book? Who am I to have a new idea? This person has a Ph.D. This person has this. This person has that. And so we because we have the social media, we're all constantly comparing ourselves. I don't have six pack abs like that guy or, you know, so we're constantly making these comparisons. And so what happens is we feel like we're living a lie. And so what I call that is I call that the myth. And so if we turn that on its head, we go from the hero's journey of the one person bringing their story, being brave enough to show up authentically, hiring the ghostwriter, hiring the, you know, the production company to help them think about these kind of stories and then bring that to the collective so that people can engage with it and learn from it. And so and then that I'm going to bounce off of what you said, um, Frank, that creates the value. And now Mm -hmm. we're doing this in tandem. We're actually, you know. We're creating this thing that gets that buys us a bid at some of that short term interim attention, but then it's also paving the road for a long form attention. So, you know, if you write a book with me, if we if we sit down and we spend six to nine months writing a book or whatever it is, um, what is awesome about that and what people don't realize is I tell my clients that a book is your vehicle. You know, it's a, it's a cost intensive product, but it's a safe investment in terms of, in terms of social media, you know, Frank, I gotta say, um, and Jack, I gotta say that, um, buying a book and investing in creating a book, the time and the money and and expertise and everything, it's like buying gold, you know, it's like, Mm -hmm. it's not going to lose its value because the thing is probably going to end up. I mean, how many books do you have in your attic that are written from God knows right. when, hundreds of years ago, like you said, 70 million books. And that thing is a cherished work of art that is going to probably outlive us both, frankly. So sure. so yeah. having having that kind of investment, it now becomes something that five years from now, 
you can go on when you're when you're in the middle of a pandemic. I don't know how many authors I saw doing this where they're like, today I'm reading chapter one of my book. Tomorrow I'll be reading chapter two. And this book is written several years ago. It's not new content, but because the pandemic was perfectly primed, they needed content. And all they had to do was open up the book that they wrote years ago. And then there's your chapter, you know, there's yeah. your social media posts, there's your podcast conversation. So sure. kind of tying in some of those things. And um, so what I, you know, what I'm really excited about is this idea of how do we make this crossover? How do I, I was on a conversation earlier and I called it a scavenger hunt across mediums, across channels to make your content. So, you know, I, I think I mentioned in TikTok, the algorithm is such that it, they want you to loop, you know, and Netflix, they want you to binge. And so I, I think with any type of content, what we want is multiple touch points. Because, um, you know, when we reconnected recently, I, I think it'd been like nine months or something. You said, I'm so glad that you reached back out. Yeah. And I thought, oh, my God, I really appreciate him saying that because there's probably people that I've forgotten to contact. And, I'm, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. I'm embarrassed and I'm like, oh, man, I can't do this. And so I've gone back out now and I've, I've reconnected with people. And, yeah. um, and, and so, you know, showing up and adding more value. But I'm really excited about these cross-channel promotions and kind of making a scavenger hunt so they have to go on tiktok to get one part of the story go, listen oh, to the podcast yeah, to get yeah. the long form watch sure. the video to find out another clue so there's all these like hunt a killer mm. type uh boxes that are kind of spinoffs you know the um the membership boxes that they ship them to you so i'm kind of thinking about well how can we engage people who are stuck at home and they're you know they're watching video content they're listening to the audio they're reading the blogs but we all have zoom fatigue. So we're all like kind of inundated with stuff. There's never enough and there's always too much, right? It's kind of sure, that yeah. paradox. Yeah. So, so my thought is, you know, working on um, potentially uh, launching like written letters. So actually going old school and then having those be like pieces of the bread trail so that instead of just, I mean, you know, I, I joined a membership for writers the other day. And so they sent me a really nice package in the mail and, you know, a nice letter and everything. But I thought, what if there was something that made me want more, that if I yeah. really like was on there, I had to go. And, and the offer was just too, you know, it's kind of like when uh, the Netflix says, watch the next episode and you can <laughs> click. Yeah. It's too tempting because they already show you that screen capture, that one scene. And right. you're like, he's doing what? Oh my God, he's in a hospital. And so, yeah, right, 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 right. so I, I think yeah. that's, that's where, so I, I just want to kind of ask you guys, I mean, I've been obsessed with transmedia since like 2013 and I'm sure people were long ahead of me. I read a, a book by the, a, a guy, the name of Frank Rose. And, um, because I was doing um, an internship in Hollywood and um, studying at UCLA for a summer program and uh, producing and, and screenwriting and stuff. So I, um, I read this book and I mean, I sat down and I read it cover to cover because I was just fascinated because I had just seen, you know, the, um, Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy yeah. and they talked about how they put um, cell phones in cakes at certain bakeries and planted people there so that the cell phone would start ringing and people be like oh my god what's going on and then they'd have like you know guys dressed up as bomb squads and all this stuff yeah. and it was um it was totally planted people didn't know about it and then um you know people are what are they what are they doing immediately they're whipping out their cell phone they're starting buzz they're like is this real is this fake and um, and I think there's, you know, I think there's a license, an artistic license and responsibility where you have to make sure it's not fake news as Jeff Gomez gets into. But yeah. on the other hand, I think there's some real, real untapped and, and, and untapped potential. I want to I want to stress that point that there's a yeah. long way that we could go to make our stories more enmeshed with our lives, more meaningful on a personal level, because, you know, marketers, they're going to send you the hey, Frank, hey, Jack, hey, Chet, um, you know. Uh, yeah. email newsletter but yeah. none of that's actually personalized to me it just has my first name and we're smarter than that and I think that that's something that we haven't you know I said earlier that publishing 18 months behind the you know the trends of the world I think in some respects we're still kind of in the stone ages of um of the internet and how we relate to people so I'm hoping that you know I mean and then of course the the argument could be made that there's retargeting ads and all of that and uh, yeah, right. and that's very advanced and personalized but I think as a storytelling community we can be a little bit more deliberate about how we we blend the the real the kind of creative nonfiction approach with some of that Bring fiction like jack world. does yeah yeah what would yeah. you guys so you know what what are your thoughts on that or number one i want you to talk to jennifer pelle she was on the podcast before and this is the kind of work that she does live events but then not even just live events but it's the interactive it's a transmedia approach to that 
she has a great story about this. Um, they did something. She did something for Hyundai and they totally botched the absolute shit out of it. They didn't understand what she was talking about, but it was very much a scavenger hunt, kind of like what you're saying, where people were out trying to discover clues on Twitter. Right. And actually traveling around to see where these clues were to get a secret show of Imagine Dragons, which once again, I've never heard their music before. I have no idea who they are, but they were apparently were popular at one point. Um, but so that's number one. Number two. Hell yeah. Right. I mean, these worlds that when you, when I was talking, I mentioned earlier, I was talking about content. Right. And content means live. That content means everything. It, like whatever content you're having people interact with, that's everything. It doesn't matter whether or not I love the handwritten letter letter stuff, especially for the Mick Rock things. Right. Well, we'll talk about that off camera. But like that kind of stuff is like, oh, I mean, think about like what what if Harry Potter had done? A lot of that stuff like that universe had been like at the time just sending random kids letters and invitations to join Hogwarts. How amazing that would be. Maybe even if they like, you know, like the owl flying rate might have been a little bit too difficult. But, you know, it just coming in the mail like that. And you're like, oh, wait, what is this actually real? Right. Especially for the kids. But the adults would be like, oh, that's pretty cool. Now they're going to get to be, you know, invited and everything. And even at, at, at the at Hogwarts or whatever that they have at Universal, it's very immersive in that way where you get to pick your wand and you get to run around and you're a part of that story. Like it's a literal, a literal section of the story of the universe is played out only there. Right. That's the, that's the power of it. So what you just said, absolutely. I mean, transmedia people, and that's why we don't want to be labeled as anything even close to a production company because it like to literally produce transmedia means to have your hands in everything, any form of content, um, because and that's really how you're going to get somebody, like you said, engaged forever. It, it could be perpetual if you really worked at it. And you kept on nurturing the audience over and over again um, to to be able to engage with this world that doesn't really exist, but you can make it exist. But when I was, we were talking to Tim about, yeah, I was like, you know what? Like, you know, he had talked to a couple of ghost writers. Well, I'm like, no, well, you know what? Chet actually understands what we're talking about here. Like, he understands it's on a different level that I'd be far more comfortable talking to about this, you know, him ghostwriting this book for us. Um, and, you know, even talk, we have to talk a little bit more about the blogs and everything as well, um, because it's like there's a deeper understanding there of what exactly we're trying to achieve when it comes to building out this story world and this engagement that we're going to be able to be able to do. So, yes, well, once again, yeah. and I'll say it. I told it to you over the phone and I'll tell it to you on the podcast where it shall live forever until Buzzbro kicks us off for whatever reason that, you know, I, I sincerely appreciate you reaching out to us again because it was one of those things that like it totally slipped my mind and it was perfect timing to reach out. So if anybody out there has been like, hey, you know what? I should reach out to Chet or I should reach out to Frank. I haven't talked to him in a while. Go ahead and do it because you have no idea what I'm thinking. You don't know what Chet's thinking. So just go out there and do it. Yeah. Well, and I think the other thing, too, to add to that is, um, you know, in talking about this Mick Rock story, is that people care about some of these experiences that you have, no matter which industry you're in, no matter what you do, they care about that unique perspective. And it's probably, you know, you, 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 the, the fear, I guess, is that no one's going to listen. No one's going to, going to really care. I would say the corollary is actually true that more people than you think are going to show up and sure, say, that's sure. really cool. I want that. And so when you build out these stories, you know, working with other people, it just gives it more life. It just gives yeah. it a fresh perspective and it actually enhances it because, you know, you say, Hey, I've got this whole thing on transmedia. I wouldn't have thought of transmedia for the autobiography type component. And then yeah. I'm like, wow, this is perfect. I've been waiting for this. So yeah. Um, yeah and, and pick up the phone because you never know who, you know, what's, uh, what's been queued up in the pipeline for, um, for a long time that now is just ready to, to rock and roll. Yeah. Right. Well, Chet, we have gone over time. It is, it's a, we're an hour 23 all of a sudden, just out yeah. of nowhere. Um, but we usually end off with you giving us a little information. Uh, no, not that. God, I keep doing that. I keep on going back to my, you know, you have these things like pre-recorded. We've done like 50 some out of these um, Is Frank a robot? Yeah, is Frank oh, a robot, no, yeah, right. right. Yeah, now we have yeah, a Westworld West <laughs> question. Yeah, right. He tries to check that question mark. And over he, he is a host. He is a host. He's a host. He's a host. <laughs> Oh my god! I actually just finished the thir the third season not too long ago, and I am absolutely chomping at the bit for the fourth. It's absolutely fantastic. But we usually end off with you giving us some words of wisdom, any information that you think or that kind of summarizes um, the conversation that we just had from your perspective. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> well, I, I think to, to summarize it, write your book, write your speech, write your screenplay, write your blog, publish that podcast, just do it, pick up mm-hmm. the phone, you know, do that, you know, make those connections and, and, and prioritize those relationships. And if you don't know what to say, ask what people want to hear. And I think yeah. that, uh, you know, working with you and, 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 and having this conversation, I love that you're like, we're not just a production company, please for the, like, do not for label us as God. that. And so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so for me, I would say I'm not just a ghostwriter. I can help people in a variety of ways. And I think yeah. that, you know, service providers, we're all in this because we love working with people. We love helping, we love story. And so when you reach out to somebody, ask them what they can do and ask for their take. If you're going to hire somebody, you know, you go to the doctor, you ask their opinion. If you, if you hire someone like Frank or Jack, ask their opinion and you, you're going to be surprised with the results. But um, yeah, well, I am just really excited to be on here today. Um, I'm excited for all of the content that you guys produce and Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really looking forward to working together and just thank you so much for having me on. Yeah. Thanks so much for being out with us. Can I make a plug too? Uh, sure. My website is uh, ghostedbooks.com. You can see it right here. There it is. And um, yeah, I would love to uh, love to learn more from um, all of you that are listening to this and yeah. uh, create some awesome stuff uh, together in the future. Excellent. Sounds Absolutely. Good. And that and you'll find that link in the description uh, below as well um, that you can check out some more of Chet's stuff and, and give him a call if you got that story. Um, it's a good first stop. There's a good first stops all along the journey, right? Whichever one you think would make most sense for you to start off with, um, whether that's from, you know, actually writing the book or going with the blog, you'll be able to find that, um, find that entry point. But yeah, so thanks again for being out with us, Jed. Appreciate it. Likewise. Well, that was another great conversation. I mean, ghostwriting is so important into this whole ecosystem story world, whatever you really want to call it. Yeah. Um, you know, you need to have so many multi-forms of content because you never know how your audience wants to engage with that story. And, you know, you not only need different forms of content, but you need different perspectives. So like Chet was also saying, it's, it's really important to outsource to get different perspectives on the singular piece of content. That way you actually get a lot of different perspectives and, you know, they're, they're, it's just a better collective. Right, exactly. Well, that was a great conversation. So if you want another great conversation, you can look over to this side here and I'm sure you'd find one that you'd tickle your fancy. Um, also, there's a ahead. new episode of Stipulations coming out this Friday. Yeah, that's right. So uh, thanks so much for watching. Thanks so much, guys.